The catchphrase of my seminar is, we are as dry as the trees, which is a phrase I often heard from the people I'm working with, the women I'm working with, when talking about their environment and trying to describe how they feel regarding the drought they're living. And today I'd really like to talk more about the challenges of conducting participatory work when there's actually drought in the place you're studying. Um, my presentation is organised in four parts. I'll do a quick introduction about my PhD, the team, the structure. I'll then talk about what I found in the field, how it was to go back in the field. Um, I'll share with you how I'm trying to make sense out of it. So the reflection that is happening since being back and I'll just finish with a few thoughts about the future. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. I should be able to go back on track afterwards. So if you have any questions, simple or complicated, feel free to just ask. Okay, the team here at CORE is Michelle Pember and Stephanie Lemke. And I've got three local gatekeepers, let's say, back in Senegal where I'm working. And really the first contact was Ali Ndiaye. He's the coordinator of the Senegalese Association for Peasant Seed Producers. He'd been in touch with Michelle for quite a while about PhD, about ideas and projects. And so when I arrived with some experience about Senegal, um, it became clear that we could work together. But Aliou was very clear from the beginning and he said, we are an umbrella organization and we'd, it would make more sense to study a specific case. And he suggested working with Yusuf Sar, who's the coordinator of Centre Fafa, which is an agroecology school in a very small village in Senegal called Ndiman. So we met with Yusuf Sar, it was very good, like the connection was good. Having said that, the centre was going through some changes and so we thought rather than studying the centre and its agroecology initiative, let's work directly with the village. And so there's a group in the village called Group Mbogaif, who's a group of women, they're about 45, 50, and they're very much involved in peasant seeds, in agroecology, but they also have wider social activities. So for example, uh, celebrations for christenings, weddings, and other things like that. And they work very much with their children also, so teenage children mainly, and there's obviously all the little ones around. And Fatou Chao is the first contact. So when I go to Senegal, I actually stay at Fatou Chao's house and work with her, but Yusuf Saad is often there, most of the time he's the main translator, he's also a very good technical translator, let's say he knows very well um, the situation. He's from the same ethnic group, but he's not from the village, but he's worked there for a long time. And Fatou Chao and I get along very well, but we do not speak any language in common. So um, Fatou speaks Sered, and she will understand a little bit of Wolof, and I might speak other languages, but none of them is useful when communicating with Fatou. But we get along very well, and with the help of Yusu and of the children, so when Yusu needs to go back to his family or whatever, I stay with Fatou and her children or other children in the area. Whoever is around them, I speak a bit of French, comes along and is excited to help and, and, and help translate. So that's quite a specific relationship really to have when you're working. Uh, just to give you, so this is uh, the group in Bogaif with the five main women that lead the group. Uh, Mamadou is the son of one of the women and this is Yusuf Sar. So although the group is 45 strong, I tend to work mainly with these five and then there's the other ones that come along and discuss and everything, but these are the five uh, in the core discussion, let's say, and the participatory work we're doing together. And just to give you a quick overview of Senegal, so it's a West African country, borders Mauritania, Mali, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, there's the Gambia here, and the Atlantic Ocean. And I work here, so in what's called the Little Coast, so between Dakar and the Gambia. And it's a village that is not far from the coast, only a few miles, but it's actually not connected to the coast. And this is because the main ethnic group here is Serer, but there are many... Well, there are five, uh, four different types of Sered, and the group I work with is not Sered Pofofi, so they're not fishermen, they are Sered Sin, they are farmers. So although they're very, very close to the coast, they don't really deal with the coast. And so to give you a quick overview, so the initial idea was to work on food systems and looking at resilience. And the idea was actually Centre Fafa, the agroecology school, has created a very resilient system that works very well, let's look at it. 
Um, we thought about organizing ideas because all of this is very complex and it can be very broad looking at different aspects of life, so not just farming, but also social aspects, cultural aspects. So we thought about using the sustainable livelihoods framework, but changing it to make it more adapted to a resilient food systems framework, let's say. And I'm studying specifically Ndiaman, so this village, so looking at the Ndiaman food system. And taking so the sustainable livelihoods framework, I adapted it to my research question. So the first one being, how is this in the demand food system defined and organized, so looking at assets and structures, and then looking at its vulnerabilities and how it has evolved. I then look at strategies, so at the present, how they're dealing with these uh, vulnerabilities. And finally, um, the big question, is the system resilient or not? And I'm using mixed methods. So interestingly, the first one that was suggested, so when we first went to Senegal, Michelle and I, in February 2017, <coughs> when we met Groom Bogaif and we agreed about how to work together, do we want to work to together, they said straight away, let's do some videos together. This was a big surprise for me. But they said it was a good way to connect between generations, which is a big challenge at the moment over there. Uh, these women feel they have a lot of knowledge, but they're getting old. They can't farm as much as they used to, and they want to pass on this knowledge to the youngsters, but they might not be so keen to learn about it. And they thought, actually, if we make films, if there's all this technology side of things, they might be attracted and come along and make the films and meanwhile learn a lot. So they suggested participatory video. It just so happened I'd been trained on it, so it was perfect. Off we go. I'm also using other, um, other methods, other tools, so archiving, looking at archives, doing focus groups, mapping, interviews. I'll look at, into some of these uh, later on. And just to give you a quick overview about the PhD structure in itself, so it all starts in a very straightforward way every time, doesn't it? So I started in January 2016, aiming to finish in January 2019. I was a full-time student and I had clear slots for field work. But then something happened, something very big happened and changed my whole life and my PhD. So, right, how do you adapt to this? Um, so I decided to go part-time. I was really too tired during pregnancy to continue full-time. And I thought even afterwards, it's not realistic to go back full-time. I wanted to dedicate some time also to being a mum. So I decided as soon as possible to go part-time. And then I went on maternity leave for 12 months. So I've been back since roughly April. Uh, readapting to this life three days a week doing the PhD and I've got clear slots for field work but as you can see they've changed a lot so the dynamic is different I've actually dedicated quite a lot of time to looking at archives for example which was not planned in the initial or not as much in the initial uh, setup and so I went back to the field in June and that's nearly two years after my first big trip so a lot had happened on my side during those two years. I'd been in touch with them during those, those two years. Um, and they were very keen for me to be back. There was a lot of excitement also because all of these women are mums. Some of them are grandmas. And so me being a mum now would be also a new connection. It would be interesting to see how that affected things. Um, and I very much prepared for my field work as I did for the previous one. So I got all my equipment, got all the cameras again. I got uh, lots of list of things I wanted to ask and all this process going on, prepared to go back, um, thinking it would all pretty much be the same. But when I got there, there was a very, very clear message from the team. They said, no more filming. And when they said no more filming, they meant no filming, no sound recording, no photography, zero. They said, you're allowed to write. But even then, uh, we don't want you to share that widely. Uh, we are concerned about yeah, our information, our image and everything. This was a big surprise for me, big surprise. And because I only went for three weeks and I was in a rush to work and be efficient, suddenly you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> so um, it just showed that you need to rebuild trust. And although you do stay in touch all this time, you need to rebuild trust and re-understand, let's say, re-agree. We went back to the ethics, for example, of the project and what do we really want from this and what is participatory work. And so it really required a, a, going back to square one. Um, so meanwhile, we thought about doing other activities. Uh, for example, um, one of the ideas was to draw the village. 
uh, either on paper uh, with a pen, for example, and I brought some equipment, but people are really, really reluctant to work with paper and pen. None of these women can read and write, and even the children are not confident writers. Uh, so the idea of getting these weird things in your hand is it, just very uncomfortable and they don't want to do it really. Um, even drawing on sand, for example, with a stick, they're not comfortable. They might talk about it for hours, but they don't want to express it visually, let's say. But I had brought some Google Maps images, some satellite imagery, different scales. And although I thought they might be surprised and even a bit suspicious, like, how did you get an image of my house? Um, they loved it. They really loved it. And they really engaged with it. So this is one example where we drew so the different neighborhoods of the village. This is all in the Amman. This is a bit of a periphery of the Amman. But these are the four main neighborhoods, and I work mainly in Malawi. So they were very keen to see this. There's very specific ones where you can actually see the concession, so the houses per family. And they're very keen to, to explore that. And also what you do with imagery like this. So you realize actually Kut is not that far away, although it feels far away. Actually, no, it's not. So this was a process they really enjoyed. Another one was discussing daily activities. So we got 24 little stones representing the 24 hours of the day and we organized them on the floor. So as a group, somebody would volunteer to talk about their day and we'd organize them on the floor according to the activities using different props. So uh, for example, the sticks here are fetching wood, water is uh, fetching water, uh, cooking, the hat was for washing clothes, uh, cleaning with the broom, the shoe was actually going to the um, next village along to buy some things to sell back in this village. Um, and then tea, there's a tea bag and this is a sachet of um, powdered milk that represented breakfast, if you're lucky enough to have powdered milk for breakfast. But they also really enjoyed this and although at the beginning they were a bit <laughs> finding it funny, like what kind of game is this? Uh, they actually got really into it, um, they then helped find props, so we just found things around and people would join in and suggest something. And we ended up doing so women, men, um, rainy season, dry season and preparation for the rainy season, which uh, yeah, is, is in between the two, let's say. And you were allowed to take pictures again? So here I was allowed to take pictures because you cannot see anyone, you can't tell where we were. So on this occasion, this was again really early on in the field work and, they, and I asked, can I take a picture of this? They said yes, so yeah, there's some feet. Even I can't recognize this feet, I think. So, so yeah, they said on this occasion you can. Another thing I'd done so was archival research. Uh, I brought a few pictures and for example, this is a, so a village well, now is actually a huge town, but um, it used to be a village. This is from 1681. And um, they keep telling me in demand that it used to be completely forested. And so I said, look, I found this image from 1681. It's from nearby and it's full of trees. And I thought they would engage with this because it's visual, it's quite, some of the maps are very colored and colorful and, and so it's great. Actually, they, they didn't find it very fun. They were like, well, yeah, that's what we told you. So what's the big news about this? So it, it was funny because I was expecting more excitement about this, but there wasn't that much. Um, and then we did a lot of field visits. So that was when trust was being rebuilt and it was good. They were trying to show me the situation and how things had changed in these two years. So for example, this is Walid Youf's field. This is not Walid Youf, but it's his field, um, Walid's field. Um, and you can clearly see the difference between now and then. So in 2017, the field was absolutely covered in plants. It was mainly peppers, but it also had some nurseries with aubergine, tomatoes. A lot was happening. It's not exactly the same month, but it's the same time of the year, let's say. So the end of the dry season, beginning of the preparation for the wet season. And uh, when we went to his field now, you can only recognize uh, the same tree, this one. And, uh, and the first time I went, so it, we were chatting and walking in, in the sand and yeah, talking a lot. And I, I know my way around the village, but it's still new. And two years later, obviously, things have changed. But we were talking and chatting and eventually it just stopped. And he said, you don't know where you are. And he was like, well, no, sorry, should I? And he just said, well, we are in my field. 
So we were here in the middle of nothing and he just said, we're in my field. And when you know how important farming is for these people and you suddenly arrive and there's just nothing, absolutely nothing, you realize this has a huge impact on their livelihoods, obviously. And the situation repeated itself over and over. So Michel Duf is actually, I think, it's probably the person I know that has the widest agroecological knowledge. He's just a living encyclopedia and he's so kind and happy to share. I love chatting with him. Um, and when I visited in 2017, his field was covered in papaya trees and, and there was all sorts of crops and intercropping and all these techniques. He knows so much. And again, when we went this time, there was just nothing. So he was explaining, for example, that the wells went, um, the amount of water decreased, eventually it went salty, and then it was just gone. And he explained the papaya trees have a very, the, their root system is not very deep, so actually with the drought, they die quite quickly. So there was just nothing, and that also means you've got nothing to do, and your children have nothing to do, because usually you're very busy in the fields. Just as an example, this is Michel Duf's, uh, Michel Duf's uh, wells in 2017. You can see some frogs, uh, and now there's just nothing. And this is for all the wells I saw. And just to finish, so here's the field from Gruppen Bogaif. They didn't really have the field back in 2017, so I can't really compare. But you can see that it's the same situation. Everything's dry, the wells are abandoned, broken, dry. Okay, after a, year, a week and a half, it felt like a year and a half, but after a week and a half, one day the women got back to me and they said, today we want to make a film. We've got something to say, we want to share it. Can, you, can, you, can we make a film? I got really excited. So this is the moment I've been waiting for. So I got, we got all the equipment. The women had been trained two years before. They remembered how to use it, but they said, actually, it was four women and they said the four of us want to be on screen we want to talk about our own issues so we'd like you to film but you're going to film like this like this like this you'll go here you'll turn the camera at this point you'll focus there they told me everything i was just a technical assistant which i'm very happy about and they wanted the four of them to be in front of the baobab in their field and talk about their issues um, the, although they used some props um, they improvise all the text on the spot. So there's one take, there's action, the four of them talk, you'll see it's very fast and they often overlap. Um, but there's one take, we went to a different location, second take, done, let's go home. So this I can discuss a bit further with you, but this is how we're choosing to work back, back in Senegal. Um, I've not been able to translate the second half of the film, but I'd like to show you the first five minutes. So. Um, I'll stop at some point, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, just to give you an idea. Uh. <laughs> I'm 
So yeah, I was saying that the credits are a big deal when you do village um, projections because writing them is pointless and people can't read, but when you, they hear their voice and they hear their names, it's, it's a big deal. Um, so yeah, so that was the first part of Ulfane. Um, when I was 
in Senegal, again, another peasant, Blaise Diouf, who's a young uh, agroecology, uh, agroecological farmer, uh, approached me and he said, well, actually, I've been trained so in 2017 and I've been filming since. I've got lots of little films I've been making. I'd like you to help me editing them. And again, I was more of a technical assistant. So because I have the computer and the knowledge, I could help him collate all these films together. He had a specific song he wanted as a um, background. He spoke also to introduce the film. So again, I was just enabling what he, his vision, basically. Um, and then uh, I had the chance to speak with Aliou twice, so talking about his knowledge of Ndiaman and the situation back there and the drought, but also he's got a very wide knowledge of the country and agroecology in Senegal, so it was an interesting discussion. Okay, so the challenges in the field. Um, I find very often when we talk about participatory work, it sounds great and we assume that because we started this together and we discussed it and built it together, then things will move on like that together. And for me, getting there and being told, actually, yes, we agreed on this two years ago, but we don't want to do it anymore. Although, yes, your project's continuing, but we changed our mind. Although it's totally fair and it's part of the deal and you're allowed to change your mind, anyone is allowed to change your mind, you also feel like, well, hold on a second. We agreed on this together. You came up with the idea of filming and now you're telling me we can't film anymore. So if there's a funny feeling there of what's going on. Um, but it's something that needs to be accepted and worked on and trying to understand why they changed their mind is really important and if it's because we need to rebuild trust then it's totally fair that they say that and as you've seen by the end they actually were keen to make a film um, power influence and leadership so this is a really interesting one also because i think there's a big difference obviously between me turning up and working for a few weeks together but these women they live together all the time and they live in the same village they live in the same neighborhood they might live in the same house they might be married to the same man so some of these women are co-wives and there's a lot of competition going on there's a lot of power dynamics there's a lot of influence and they'll acknowledge this they'll talk a lot about this they say there's a lot of competition between us i want to show i'm the best wife i want to show our neighborhood's doing better than the other ones i want my children to do well so power influence is really really important and leadership for me was again reviewing your notion of leadership so i found that the president for example could make her own decisions sometimes on behalf of the group but actually she never did so even if she sometimes talked and gave an opinion that was meant to be the groups, she would always say, actually, I need to talk with the group and you can only, I will only give consent. So we talk a lot about consent over and over. And she, she said, you, I'll only give consent for you to share this if the group tomorrow tells me they agree with what I've said. But this, although makes information a lot more robust, it also makes it a lot slower, a lot, lot slower. And if some woman doesn't turn up the day after, then it's the day after that we'll discuss this. Or the day after. Or you know what, next week. Or you're not here. Well, maybe when you come back, we'll give consent. So when you're trying to make your project move forward, this is a bit, okay, I know I agreed to this, but, but again, I, I, I also see the point and I agree with that notion of leadership. Language and illiteracy. So I, I mentioned this briefly before. Language is a huge challenge. I actually found, and I discussed this in my previous seminar course, so August 2017, um, although initially it felt like a big problem not to speak the language, not to speak Sered, it actually, I find, strengthens the project. I could have worked just with French-speaking people in the village, but it would have been such a minority that really doesn't represent <coughs> the village and definitely not the group, these women, most women. Um, so they feel they're in the driving seat. They do their own discussions, they feel very happy and strong about that and eventually they'll pass on some information to me but it's, it's quite a slow process uh, but it does have disadvantages but it also may have some advantages. And illiteracy it's just understanding different ways of working and for me writing is essential and one of the reasons I've not learned the language is because I learn so much just by reading and writing. I need to write something to remember it and if there's no book to learn Serer then how am I going to learn? And, and it's really silly maybe but it just shows how dependent we are on writing and by the end of my stay, so three weeks let's say, in June it was three weeks, I've written so much 
on my little booklet, all this autoethnography, and I write, I write, I write, and when I have a bit of free time, I just sit somewhere and I write. And they come to see him, they're like, what are you doing? What is that? They turn the pages, you know, like, what is this? So very often I'll read out loud, for example, if it's in French, I'll translate if it's in English, I'll show my drawings, I'll discuss some diagrams. They're very unfamiliar with that form of expression, but when you talk, they're really happy to hear. And I'm just showing, look, I'm not in any conspiracy here. I'm just trying to make sense of what you've told me. I'm writing some stories you've told me, for example. So they like that transparency of, you know, making that book less mysterious. So ongoing requests for financial support. This is a problem that comes from the past, really, in a way, because the village has actually had a lot of white Westerners that arrived full of good intentions, they came up with a project, they built something, for example, so wells, lots of wells, uh, but actually they leave and then the consequence, uh, well, the villagers need to deal with the consequence. And although the initial idea is positive, building wells is potentially something good and the project might have been using a, a participatory approach, <coughs> actually the consequence might be negative. So at the moment there are too many wells in the village, too many people using water pumps, and so there's no more water. So there's a it would be interesting to blame, well, you shouldn't have built the wells in the first place. Anyways, white Westerners are seen as people that come and bring money. So when I arrive as a white Westerner, they're like, well, good, what are you going to do then? What are you going to build? So trying to change that dynamic and explaining that I'm a student. And so this is, again, building trust and explaining the situation. But it's an ongoing thing. The drought. So the drought has been happening for a while. So basically 2017 was not a very good year, 2018 was a bad year, and 2019, so now June 2019, was just a combination of two bad years. So there's just no water, nowhere in the village. And they need to fetch water in the separate village like the women were saying in the video. And this has had a huge impact on the environment. As you saw, the, f the fields are just empty, but also psychologically. And I found it incredibly um, devastating to see how demoralized people were. So when I was saying, come on, let's do some work, participatory works, things that mattered for you, they actually felt no motivation. And they were just saying, look, our problem is water, we need water. Yes, that's interesting. Yes, we want to do it, but we just don't have the energy. So the social and, um, yeah, the social and psychological impact of the drought is massive. Another thing was solidarity. So the first time I went, people would very happily share meals all the time. We'd go to every house. It wasn't just me because I was there. It was just in general. Now it was a lot more, can I feed my family? I'm definitely not feeding my co-wife's family and uh, the neighbor. I don't know. So really it was a lot more, they were saying there's less solidarity and, and to a certain extent yet less depending on each other. But this obviously had a huge impact on participatory work. So I've been trying to make sense of all of this and it all felt very negative. So I've been trying to work with the problem tree analysis and thinking about the idea. So the trunk, the problem being there's less and less farming. People are not farming this year. Or, or in June, people weren't farming, there was no water. So what are the root causes of this problem? And I highlighted climate change and sustainable farming practices and deforestation as three key problems. Not all the farming is unsustainable, but there are some practices that are unsustainable. <coughs> this leads to land degradation and they will acknowledge this. So farmers will totally recognize there's a big problem with land degradation and the drought has just made the problem worse, like much worse. The core problem being less farming, <coughs> less self-sufficiency and more and more dependency on buying food and really the monetized economy. And there are three ways to approach this. So if people are farming less, they may start some small local entrepreneurship, paid local seasonal work, or actually just leave, so rural exodus. And when we look at small local entrepreneurship, we see this village is not really into crafts, so they're not known for making baskets or paintings or fabric or something. They might sell some livestock as a last resource, but it's often at the wrong time of the year, so they don't get much income out of it. I've been calling it tradesmanship. I don't really, I need to think about this word, but basically there's a new road and a lot of the youngsters are learning how to drive and they're becoming taxi drivers. This is a good source of income, but obviously not all the youngsters can do this. So it's only for some and a temporary approach maybe. Shopkeeping sometimes for some men and some women might sell door to door. And then there are two key issues. So the first one is selling firewood. 
a lot of it is controlled, illegal, whatever, controlled by the government, I mean, or illegal, but um, <coughs> selling wood like this, so this is just before cooking in Fatou Chia's house, so um, firewood, and then what I've been calling joal wood, so it's all the smaller wood, let's say, so twigs and small branches and straw that are on the floor and usually left just as a cover to protect from the sun, the rain, the wind. But now it's all being collected to sell in Joal, which is a nearby city where women smoke fish. So it's a very small source of income, but it's actually helping. The problem of these two is that they really reinforce deforestation. So they're really a very, very negative cycle. And again, people will acknowledge this. They'll say, yes, it's, it's not helping our situation. If we go back so to the three approaches, we can see that really all of them I mean there's less farming labour available because people are doing other things. There's less farmland being used. And in Senegal, if you don't use your farmland, the government can take it for free. So really they rather sell it. So if they see that they're not using their land, they'll try and sell it. But really that reinforces the problem of there's less land, there's less farming. Really you're just making the problem more complicated. On the other hand, you're increasing external influences, especially the youngsters that go away to work or whatever, they come back with new requests and new wants and new influences. There's a loss of tradition, there's a loss of social connection and solidarity, and again, especially the women will talk a lot about this and how it's been negative and reinforcing this negative cycle. So really what I felt was that when I was in Senegal and coming back was this just really negative impression. There's just such negative cycles going on, these vicious cycles going on that just are what I've been calling for now a long-term destruction of their livelihoods, of their situation. And I've been trying to make sense of it because people are continuing to do this, although they acknowledge that it's just destroying their situation. And so the way I've been trying to think about it is not to think about less farming, but more about still farming. Because this is really the big thing is people are still farming. People are still living in their land. They're still peasants. They're still farming to some extent. Yes, there's a lot less self-sufficiency. They're still totally dependent and more and more dependent on purchasing food and all these other ideas and clothes and whatever. But Actually, they are still farming, they're still in their village, and therefore they're still Serer Sin. And that is the key idea. The idea of leaving the village is just, no, that, that would be a real disaster. But as long as you can maintain maybe a short-term survival, and I know survival is a strong word, but for now, this is a resilient uh, approach. Like we, We'll do this for as long as it takes, although we acknowledge there's a long-term destruction, but this means we can still remain Serer Sin, we'll remain peasants in our land. Okay, what's next? So I'm going back in the field in October, just in three weeks. And the big question obviously is, are they willing to collaborate? Are we continuing the participatory work? What, what's gonna happen? What do they think? Um, we'll explore a bit more the notion of food system and resilience. There's a lot more to be said about this. Uh, but we'll also we'll talk more about time and cycles and trying to discuss these ideas. Yes, they acknowledge it, but how, how do they see it? What kind of approaches? <coughs> Um, and also what I've been finding quite challenging, so when you, we did like a SWOT analysis, so talking about strengths and weaknesses, it was fine, but then talking about opportunities and threats, there's very much this link to God. So God will help us, God will come and save us, and this, this relation to God is actually often unquestionable. You're not going to play God by guessing the future, and also you're not going to challenge God, and definitely not me. <laughs> so. God is definitely a massive presence in this whole approach, but I'm not the right person in a way to look at it. But Blaise Diouf, so the farmer I told you that has been doing the videos, is really keen to look even more into tradition and discuss the idea of God. Um, so the, the, the idea is to expand on that together with him, but with the group, and they're very willing to, to discuss that. So we'll see what that brings. That's everything. Thank you very much. Jokanjal.